Um, so if anybody's had a chance to look those over, check their grades, I was wondering if you had any questions or wanted me to go over anything that was on there uh, before I go on. All right, if not, then let's get going. Uh, first thing we're gonna do today is I'm gonna talk to you about our next project. That's gonna be our sourdough project. Um, there's kind of a lot of stuff involved in getting that set up. It's not a hard project, but there are a lot of pieces. Um, so I wanna make sure I give you guys a thorough rundown of that. So make sure you find all this stuff. Um, so let's start here. Oh, that's the wrong one. All right, does everybody see sourdough stuff? So this is in uh, last week's PowerPoint. So if you want to go and find that, it'll be in there. I've also, I think I've made a new sourdough module, which will have all these links. Um, if not, I'll make it by the end of the day. Uh, so first things first, you're going to need to go to both of these links. Um, one is size starter and one is a student's discover page. Um, and you're gonna need to collect these materials, uh, flour, water, the container, rubber band, towels and tablespoons. It's pretty simple stuff. We've got a picture here of it. Then your setup for this is gonna be due next mm, Thursday. So by next Thursday, you're gonna need a selfie just like you had with the ecosphere, uh, just so I can confirm that you guys have made this. Um, so just like the ecosphere, this is gonna be a two segment process. So you're gonna make your first sourdough, make all these observations over the course of two weeks, make a new hypothesis, you're either gonna change maybe volume of water, type of flour you use, the container you put it in, um, location, anything you wanna change about it, uh, make a new hypothesis for what might change with that, and then make a second jar, and that will run for another two weeks. Uh, there's going to be daily data collection for this. So like the, or unlike the ecosphere, ecosphere, you're just kind of observing and maybe taking notes on over time. And then that'll help you do your four week assessment and whatnot. This one, you do have to collect daily data. It's pretty simple. Wait, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't think any of us can see your slides right now. We're like looking at your email page. Oh, well, that's not great. <laughs> yes. Don't know why that's not. So let's try. All right, how about now? Yes, thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, so two jars, each one is two weeks, daily data collection. That's just gonna involve like the height of the sourdough and a couple other things. I'll show you the page in a second so you guys see the actual measurement you'll be taking. Um, cool, so that's gonna be it for here and I'll show you the websites. Sorry, I was sharing the wrong stuff. So if you go in your lab manual, you're gonna find this whole procedure under lab three. So the photosynthesis and respiration lab. The first page is kind of just the stuff we went over in lecture, which you've been tested on at this point. And then the sourdough thing starts on the back of that page. Um, and it's still got, it's got both of those links on it again. So you'll find them there, they'll be on Canvas. They're in these slides. You should be able to access those links and the procedure starts on the third page. So I would really advise you guys to like read through this. Um, with the ecosphere, I had a decent amount of people do it wrong would be the best way to say that. Um, so please read through this. You know, I'm gonna go through these best I can now, but it's gonna help if you go through it as well. So once you've read through it, the first place you're gonna go, um, is the right Firefox window. Hold on one sec. Too many things are going on. There we go. Okay. They're seeing the students discover page. I'm gonna assume yes because that looks right. Cool. So this is the first one I'm gonna want you to go to. Um, it's got that picture again that was on my slides. It's got some background. 
you don't need to look at this curriculum stuff. That's just kind of extra for us as teachers, I guess. Um, materials, again, uh, we don't need pH strips. If Again, if you have them, cool, go ahead and take pH, but not gonna be required for this. I won't take points off if you can't fill out pH. Um, and then down here, so these are important links. You're gonna make sure, you need to make sure you scroll all the way down to get to these. Um, entering your data, clicking on this link is going to take you to the SciStarter page. So you can either just go directly to the SciStarter with the link that we've provided, or you can click on it here. And it's gonna take you to this page. Uh, once you get to SciStarter, you have to make an account. Uh, if you don't make an account, you won't be able to enter the data, and that's a significant part of the grade for this. Uh, so it's got a bunch of basic information again, but once you've created an account, you'll be able to click on this participate button over here. So you click on that. And it's going to bring up this page. Um, so we are going to be importing our data kind of in two ways. There's going to be a separate data sheet that I'll show you in a second. And then there's the data on here. It's all the same information. You just have to write it down twice, basically. So on day zero, start date, when you make your starter dough, you have to put in temperature of the room, radius of your jar, smell of the sourdough, the height of the sourdough, pH if you want to, and then any other observations and the date. And so then you're gonna have to do those same recordings every day for I believe it's 15 days. Um, and like I said, you're taking these on your data sheet as well, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so you don't need to fill in this website every single day if you just fill out that data sheet every day. And then at the very end, you can go in and put it all in here. Um, that's up to you. Obviously, you can do it in both places every day if you want. Um, but a significant portion of this grade is going to be you submitting your results on SciStarter. So I'm going to need at some point like a screenshot that shows that you submitted those. So after all that data gets entered, you also have to upload photos. So that data sheet, you're gonna upload a photo of that here. Um, and if you wanna upload a picture of your sourdough, I don't know if that one's required. No, it's not. So you don't need to add a second picture. Um, you're gonna submit another picture to Canvas for me. Um, but that is gonna be, I think, 50 points of this grade. So don't miss this part. This is really important. And if you have a hard time finding that again, you can email me from the office hours, but remember, make an account, go to participate, and that's where that all is. Um, back on this sourdough starter site, so that was under enter your data. If you go here to data sheet, there's the data sheet. So it's all the same stuff, date, height, well, it's got bubbles. I guess that wasn't on the other one, so feel free to put in bubbles. Temperature, aroma, pH, height, and pH. And these are before and after feeding. Um, so it's all the same stuff, 15 days again. Um, so make sure you fill this out in addition to the website. And remember, we're gonna be doing this whole thing twice through as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the sourdough. So for next Thursday, you just need to turn in a selfie showing me that you've started it. Um, and you can obviously start that any day between now and then. So this is gonna work. People are gonna differ a little bit because as soon as you start that, you have to start making your observations. So if you start it tomorrow, it's gonna to be tomorrow plus 15 days. If you make it next Thursday, it's then plus 15 days. So that's gonna mess our timeline up a little bit, but I should be able to adjust assignments accordingly. Uh, just make sure that you start as soon as you start. I think that's it for this. Does anybody have any questions on the sourdough before I get to the lecture? Can you repeat what day you recommend us to start this? Um, I mean, the sooner the better. If you can start it tomorrow or over the weekend, that would be ideal. But you don't need to. Um, that's going to be up to you. Thank you. One sec. All right, so if that's it for questions on sourdough, um, we'll move on to lecture. Also, I have office hours today from one to two, so if anything comes to mind by then, feel free to pop in. Right. Now, go 
using PowerPoint. Oh, of course I did. All right, give me one sec. All right. So this week we're going to talk about population ecology, which is my jam. I love ecology. Do a quick lecture and then we went over sourdough already. So that's all good. All right, starting off, what is a population? Uh, a population is simply all the members of a given species in an area. Um, pretty straightforward. In this instance, we're going to use these snails as our example. Uh, so population size is the total number of individuals in a population. So in this picture, we've got 33 snails. So our population size is 33. I know that's pretty basic, but that's an important thing to know. And then population density is the number of individuals per unit of area or volume. So in this instance, we're going to assume that this rectangle is two foot by one foot. And we've got 33 snails inside of that area. So in order to calculate the population density, you do 33 divided by two by one, and that equals 16 and a half snails per square foot. So our unit of area or volume there is square foot. And that's how you calculate density. Now, a bunch of different things can affect the population size and growth. Um, and these are initially, these are the three main ones. There are some other things, but fertility, mortality, and migration. So fertility is the number of offspring produced per individual. Mortality is the number of individuals who died in the population. And then migration is the number of individuals joining or leaving the population. And there's two kinds of migration. There's immigration and emigration. Immigration is organisms joining a population and emigration is organisms leaving a population. So collectively, these three factors all work together to determine how fast or slow a population is growing. Um, maybe if it's declining in size, uh, these are also going to affect the density. And they all work in conjunction with each other. Some even will affect each other. Next, we're going to talk about survivorship curves. So all organisms on our planet can basically fall into one of these three categories as far as how their life cycle uh, goes. Type one, this is going to be humans as well as many large mammals. So elephants also fall into this category, rhinoceros, all type one survivorship. Uh, these type of organisms have low initial mortality rate and this increases with age. So basically what that means is these animals when they are young, um, and for the most part, uh, don't really die off. And you won't see a die off in these organisms until much later in their life. And that's depicted by this blue curve. So you see it's percentage of maximum life expectancy and number of individuals. So humans will live almost till they're like 80 or 90 and then everybody starts to drop off. Um, these type of organisms generally have really low amount of offspring, which allows them to have high amounts of parental care. Um, so just like humans or elephants, you have like one or two offspring at a time for the most part. That allows you to put a lot of energy into their upbringing, keeping them safe when they're young. And it's because of this parental care that you have really low initial mortality rate. Um, in addition to the fact that by having less offspring, you're able to create a more viable offspring, a better offspring. So organisms that create a ton of offspring, a lot of them come out just not great. Um, Type two mortality rate. This is probably the most common in the wild. Uh, and these mortality is constant. So it doesn't matter what age you are, you are just as likely to die at 100 as you were when you were first born. Uh, this is gonna be your birds, kind of small mammals, rodents, uh, basically anything that's like a mid-range herbivore kind of fitting on the trophic level, that's gonna be a type two survivorship curve. Um, so they have constant mortality rate, they have a low to medium amount of offspring and low to medium parental care. Uh, so just like a slight kind of shift away from type one. And then type three, you have high initial mortality rate that decreases with age. So that's this green curve here. You can see at a young age, these organisms tend to die off rapidly. But if they survive this kind of initial culling, uh, they have the potential to live 
super long. Uh, these organisms have really high numbers of offspring and low to no parental care. So trees fit in that category. Uh, most plants, uh, any kind of marine organisms that use dispersal methods uh, to give birth, uh, those are all going to be type three, just because they're super unlikely to survive when they're young, but then they end up being fairly robust adults. So these are a few other factors that impact population. Uh, those other three were the most important for the growth of a population, but these affect uh, a bunch of other things. First of all, resource availability. And please ignore that I put predators here. That was an accident. Um, initially, food is one of the main things that's important. So for animals, that's going to be any kind of plants. It might even be smaller animals. Um, for plants, their food is light. So the amount of light and the amount of food available to an organism is going to impact that population. Additionally, the availability of water, the availability of a conducive habitat to their life cycle, and the availability of mates. These are all going to impact population. Uh, whether it be changing their size, changing their dispersal, maybe changing their migratory patterns, um, those are all going to be relevant to that population. Uh, additionally, uh, competition is going to be super important. And there's two main kinds of competition to talk about here. These are interspecific and intraspecific. So interspecific competition occurs between species. So that means two different species are competing for the same resource. So maybe you have two herbivores that both like to eat the same plant. Uh, potentially one of those herbivores is better at attaining the plant than the other one. So it's gonna be able to outcompete the other organism for that resource and potentially cause huge impacts to that other organism's population size. Um, generally, that's gonna be the most common way you're gonna see this kind of competition. You could lump predation into this. Um, so in that case, you have an herbivore and then a larger predator preying on that herbivore. And it's gonna be affected by the amount of predators in that area, how well it can hide from that predator. And all those factors are gonna tie into that population size. Then we have intraspecific competition. So this is competition within the same species. And again, just like interspecific, we have competition for resources. But additionally, we also have this affecting sexual selection. So with competition for resources, it's kind of the same deal as between species. We just have two organisms of the same species now competing for that resource. And maybe one of those is just better at eating than the other one. The other one's going to die off. Um, but that's not really going to, it'll affect the population, but not as much as interspecific. Then sexual selection. So this is kind of more important for intraspecific competition. Uh, this is where multiple organisms of the same sex are competing for an organism of the different sex in the same species. And so maybe you have a high volume of males and a low volume of females. That's going to drastically affect how a population can grow, uh, especially if there's really poor dispersal of one of those sexes. It may mean somebody has to travel super far. Uh, I read an article once about a female gray wolf that traveled almost like a thousand miles to find a mate. So things like that are really going to affect how well a population can grow and sustain itself. Next, we've got carrying capacity. Uh, carrying capacity is kind of the limit of an environment, uh, how many organisms that environment can support. And that's going to be a factor of the amount of resources in that environment. In this case, we're going to look at some rabbits. So let's say a bunch of rabbits move into an area. Uh, initially, that ra rabbit population is going to see super fast growth. So they showed up, there's like really good grass for them to eat, and they start uh, mating like rabbits. Uh, population explodes, and you can see this super steep curve here, but then it starts to shallow off at this carrying capacity line. So when they first got there, there was all this grass readily available to eat, and then population went out of control and suddenly they ate all the grass and that's causing this population to slow down its growth. Uh, so they reached the carrying capacity where resources were insufficient to sustain that population. So when a population hits carrying capacity, 
you're going to see a reduction in the reproduction rates and a reduction in the survivorship rates. So animals are going to start dying faster and reproducing slower. Uh, and this is kind of a simple graph of this where it shows it kind of asymptoting at the carrying capacity. In nature, you never see it do that. What actually happens is it's going to shoot above the carrying capacity line, overcorrect and go under it, and then kind of go like this around the carrying capacity, just kind of as a series of corrections. Um, yeah, this, I don't think I've ever seen a population actually just stop ahead of time. Um, yeah. It's speculated that humans are way above their carrying capacity line right now. So this kind of leads into food chains and food webs. Um, food chains are a really simple way to look at a food web on kind of a single organismal level. A super popular food chain that's examined all the time in marine biology is this one that's depicted here. Uh, your base of that food chain is your kelp photosynthesizing and growing. Then you've got urchins that will eat the kelp. Sea otters eat the urchins and orcas eat the sea otters. So as you can see in this food chain, there's just one organism at every trophic level. Um, but the reality is that's not how these work in nature. They're significantly more complicated. So in reality, you've got thousands of primary producers uh, photosynthesizing and producing nutrients in the ocean. And then you've got a lot of herbivores, not just urchins. There's urchins, sea stars, sea cucumbers, crabs. All these things will eat kelp. Uh, then you get a bunch of primary predators that will consume all of those organisms. And then you have fewer, but still more than one set of, uh, why am I forgetting the name? Top consumer, consumers um, eating those animals. Um, and while there are multiple organisms at every level, it does decline in size as you go up. And that is largely due to the amount of energy that's transferred through trophic levels. So that's being depicted here in this chart. Um, all that have all the amount of energy that comes between each level is 10%. So if we start with 20,000 kilocalories from our primary producers, so let's say that kelp is producing 20,000 kilocalories, the urchins are only going to be able to uptake 2,000 kilocalories. And then the sea otters would only be able to uptake 200. Orcas are only going to be able to consume 20 kilocalories. So there's a really dramatic reduction in energy flow as you move up the trophic chain. And it's because of this that you get such fewer um, top predators, just because there's not enough energy left in the system for there to be a lot of those. Um, and honestly, that makes sense, because if you had a ton of top predators, there'd be nothing left on the bottom. So that's super important. Remember the 10% thing. I guarantee I'm going to ask a question about that. I think finally, we've got predator prey cycles. So this will kind of look similar to what I was talking about with the uh, population curve asymptote or not asymptote, going around the carrying capacity. Um, so these populations cycle up and down over time. Uh, generally, what you're gonna see, or not generally, always what you're gonna see is that the prey population is increasing first. So if we go back to our rabbit example, the rabbits show up in this new place and their population explodes. Um, let's say when they moved in there, there was already a predator there. In this case, it was a bobcat. So after the rabbit population explodes, that is the bobcat's food source. So suddenly the bobcat has a ton of food to eat and the bobcat population explodes. And that follows, as you can see in this graph, shortly after the predator population explodes. But now you've got a ton of bobcats. And so the, all these bobcats are going to control the rabbit population and cause a dramatic decline. And so then the food source for the bobcat is gone and the bobcat's gonna decline and it creates this pattern. So it always goes predator up first, no, prey up first, then predator, and then down. And they kind of chase each other in this up and down shape. And you can see it every time here. The hair goes up, and then the bobcat goes up, or I guess it's a lynx. Um, and that will follow each other first. So they kind of keep each other in check. Um, you know, it's a bit messy with these populations, but uh, this is seen in ecosystems all around the planet. Another really popular one is um, elk and wolves in Yellowstone, constantly referred to in ecology papers. Um, and it's, it's always kind of the same looking pattern. So 
kind of summarize that as prey population increases, predator population will increase after delay. And then as prey population declines, predator population begins to fall. Cool. And that's it for lecture today. Uh, remember, you've got sourdough selfie due next Thursday by midnight. And your third set of INATs are due tonight. Um, for that one, it's 10 new observations, 20 total. Uh, so make sure you submit a screenshot of your observation page, just like you all did for previous ones. Uh, a lot of you are already way ahead, which is awesome. Thanks for being on top of that. Uh, if you've got a page where you've already got like 40 observations, uh, you do just have to keep submitting that every time we do this. Just kind of try and show whichever ones you want to count as the new ones when you submit that. Uh, so remember, get that in by midnight tonight. Should have 20 total. This one's worth a little bit more than the last one because we had some more observations. Um, cool. Anybody have any questions on lecture, the exam, sourdough, INAT, whatever you got? All right, that's it. You guys are